Hi everyone, thank you all for coming on this Saturday. Uh, this session is called Whip Counts, narrating the bad stories of open data sets. Um, so when we talk about this, we oftentimes think about how definitions start to impact counts that we have available within our data. So this is like this is an example that I like to present. This actually was a narrative that was going around in around 2010 around the definition of a forest and how in different countries the definition of a forest starts impacting how we locally understand deforestation. And according to one definition, um, a forest includes so much land cover of trees, whereas that is not the case in the other definition. And we can see how between these two different definitions, the image of for deforestation in the country starts to transform. So our definitions and how we agree upon what is going to count in our data starts to matter as we start This was an area that documenting wildfires in California and trying to understand the different causes of those wildfires. And we were analyzing the data and she was basically going in and she was mapping how many fires fall underneath one of these cause Right? And what well, was really interesting just in general that we had unknown causes were highest and that our stand was up here. What was really interesting to us was the fact that there was a separate cause code campfire and illegal alien campfire. And we started to ask ourselves, why is that Why is there, instead of a category, when that category could not just be developed into one category called campfire? And when we started to do some research, we started to understand some of the backstory of this data. We found out that it's that uh, category versus 2005, right around the time that it's. So we can see how these kind of different political histories. So this brings us to this kind of feature. The data does not exist without a group of people um, making categorical judgments about what has a wildfire cause code. All of these things. Um, so we have to think about this and try and put our data in context, right? So a lot of times, a lot of this discourse encourages us to eliminate bias in data work. I think that this is a really important thing for our activity. And that's what I I also think that sometimes that language distracts us from paying really close attention to some of the because all data sets have complex cultural history. You can't have a data set, it doesn't have these kinds of examples of people designing what counts and agree that it's always going to be there. And so, this idea of eliminating bias to be put on somewhat of diversion, one, because it's impossible, and two, because sometimes we talk about the data set, it can be problematic because it positions the judgment as non existent, right? It enables us to say, oh, this data is when it has it's always going to have to be And then we're not paying as much attention to what um, So this first talk is really about data yeah. and There's an idea that any more critical um, examinations about when eyes were okay with the area in which we So what is ethnography? So some of us um, name where they start long and around a lot of the time that it's recently I'm trained as a cultural anthropologist. It's my understanding of in the 1980s around Christian and um, specifically my scholarly years. Um, so, ethnography is an idea of two cultures. Um, a culture is often defined as a zoonotic. Does anybody have any? Yeah, okay. So, what that means is that oftentimes what it's not for her to understand is the meaning behind certain actions and behaviors that people take. So, so we're referring to it as an amount of really focused on all the so at, at the like service level, and if I were to date somebody, you might say, oh, she closed one eye. Right? But oftentimes we have a lot of cultural meaning that gets associated with me closing one eye. Right? It could mean that I'm lying to you, it could be that I'm joking with you, it could be all over the other things. And it's real wrong, she closed one eye to understand it and that has certain kinds of cultural things behind it. Right? Um, so they're trying to interpret again in a lot of meetings of these surface actions. It's often characterized as progressive qualitative, and it often involves extended field. So, on the example that I teach my data, yeah. I'm not going to this. It is like these stickers that we have on the surface level. These are things that we print that have a significant detail on the back. Right? But when we start trying to understand the cultural meaning behind these stickers, it opens up a lot more conversations about how communities come together. How they identify, how um, 
uh, systems of belonging get put in place, all of these things. So what is data ethnography? Um, data ethnography is basically taking these ideas of ethnography and starting to put them towards the study of ASS and the opinion structures, um, positioning those things as cultural artifacts themselves, um, data environments as cultural Data later as a different form of the cultural work. Um, and then the analysis of the social forces that are moving around and kind of interpretation of cultural meanings. So the policy in the blue is that it talks about a lot of the is it is from the idea of the new oil. And how that term starts to follow a lot of cultural meaning of it. Um, but we try to understand what when we put that up to comments, right? Does anything come to mind? Uh, what is some of the behavior behind this? power? Yes, power, yes. Data mining, yes. It's like oil will find all the support. Yeah, absolutely. So it'll be used in all these kind of purposes. Extractivism, yes. Where the data comes from matters, exactly. And then the other examples, other way to talk about here, data is a natural resource, not as something that is actively injured, right? And because we also like raw data or ape torrents or ape streams, all of these things start to position data within like the natural world as something that is just out there versus as something that even have happens. So that's one of the ways that a data and broker might look at it to force around data and probably even understand what's going on. So the workbooks you have in front of you are an approach to kind of study this. We're not going to talk about all the different ways today, um, but we're going to discuss the first of all the semiotics, which is like the meaning of the idea. So through semiotics, we are going to study data and the fishes, or what comes to count in the data. Um, the different forms of the labor, this is involves the progression of data. Uh, the different infrastructures that are shaped in the data. The discourse that surrounds the data. Risk goals that are engaged with the progression of data. And then the way that different advocacy comes to shape. So I'm going to know the examples the first in New York City set up question. So the data set by uh, documents, every New York Police Department has since 2003, and it includes information that's the reason for the stop, the demographics that use this data uh, in the 2000s to show that stops had increased 700% between 2002 and 2011. And I'm thinking of the key statistic that it was used when stop and growth were like this report, and it was ultimately the Constitution. Or be a thirty mile in the past. And then and then the second example that we'll move through is the New York City Survey. So New York City publishes the data that it has close to twenty million rows right now. And basically every time somebody calls tweets three one one, it involves some kind of a request for survey. Those calls get directed to the appropriate city agency, but as they change so they get reported in the database. And they get tagged. And then the city agency becomes responsible for kind of maintaining a history of those facts. It's available since 2010, and the data set has been a very effective way to use by journalists, makers, legislators to get it full of it to the energy city. Uh, I think I counted eight pieces of legislation that were introduced in 2018 that mandated three one one reporting from some city agency to city council so that they could keep track of for, like priority issues. City. And so, and so assuming how the data that so the first question you might ask yourself is like, what is the formal definition for the unit of observation in this data set? And who says the data set? Who gets to decide what counts and what doesn't count? And then who might be excluded from consideration because of that? And a lot of the times you could just go and look at the definition and make these assumptions on our own. But I think that the story becomes a lot more interesting when we start tracing the history of that. Oftentimes, the data sets have been interesting. As people realize that the data did not cover a lot enough scope, and now we need to take anchors of something that data sets about institutions that are basically required to disclose certain information about the past. This is a lot of uh, politics to advocate for changes in that so that certain people no longer have to report. So we can start to track that history and tell a backstory of how that definition came to be. So, for example, in 311, 
what is the perfect request? What is interesting about under the definition is that it's one of the most expansive definitions of the service request of any city. So other cities will document more than one service request, but uh, not nearly as much. There are over 500 complaint types that are reported in New York City uh, reading one service request. Um, and the categories that are available uh, have a common under scrutiny at different moments in time. So, for instance, around 2018 to 2017, uh, there was a lot of kind of advocacy around, but there's no category in 311 for complaints about drugs. And so you had different legislators across the city, different uh, cities, you know, that were coming out and saying, we needed a category of the data sets so that we produced a data fix that showed that there's a problem with And then you had other folks saying, no, we can't do that. You know, these categories are already set in stone. This is a better problem to set it out. And in that kind of a political lobby, Starts to the literary. And then the other really key thing about Council 301 is that NYSA does not get Right? NYSA does not get included in housing complaints. Those calls get redirected to a separate calling center, and anytime somebody calls with housing complaints about an extra property. And so because of that, when we go, when we look at it, all the complaints in the state, we're not actually kind of creating the information about some of the uh, areas where there might be the most housing. Okay, so the second area is about labor. Uh, so here we can look at who are all the laborers involved in the end of setting, collection, cleaning, aggregation, publication, all the different. And then we start thinking about not just like who's in the all, but what are the different reporting that are the words that play and then the people that have heard the work, and then what are the different social forces in play that impede their ability to do work. So a classic example from the Southern Crypt is uh, the so in the 1990s, Hotstab was the Industry of Strategy for Policing in the city. And basically, what this did was, as a mechanism of accountability, different precincts were required to produce statistics that were showing reductions in crime. And if they were unable to produce these statistics that were showing enough stops, it incentivized over policing in some of the cases, and incentivized creative and policing practices. And because we have this kind of Unit sets that asks us to pay attention to different individuals that are uh, that are long and long that are afraid of different issues. And we think so. One classic example is that I've researched and been trying to understand the extent to which gentrification might play a role and in the number of three one one calls that happen. And there has been some research that indicates that folks in communities that are more highly gentrifying are have. Of course, uh, uh, higher previous visit to all three rural cases, and then other people will hear higher there because there's, there's another really interesting story that appeared in the New York Times in 2018 about this kind of month long period in April where there was a specific number of calls that were coming in on a single day on a single strip street. About illegal sign complaints in the same arrests. Uh, there's a law in New York City that if you're signage, not for the six feet, it's a law that no one really pays attention to anymore. However, during this one month in April, a lot of these complaints made and then he made a hold on single streets uh, on single days. Which suggests that there may have been one person that was actually going through and is systematically reporting about illegal signage. However, all of these calls are anonymized, so we can't know this for sure. We can only speculate that it may be a bit of a person that uh, serves to benefit from the fines that would show up to the small amount of cost costs of the uh, areas of the city. That public the merit is and get out to the owners. It could have been not a basic. So you don't know for sure. Um, and that's one of the next pieces on infrastructure. If we try to not all of these, it could be things like like ministerial infrastructure, like servers, and databases, all out of the infrastructure that needs to be in place in order for the data. But it could also be non material things, like classification systems, all laws in terms of infrastructures, for data, all of those things. And we might ask ourselves, like, who has to say the design of this infrastructure? And who gets included? We might ask, in what ways might this infrastructure break it down? And what happens when it does? And how we find that this infrastructure of all the so a really interesting example comes from the Zahn and data. Uh, so one of the key infrastructures of the Zahn and data is this US-254. 
Uh, we need to study on the throat is required to fill out any time they conduct the side in the first city. Um, and then class information on this form, the time of the stop, things like the name of the person stopped, the address, their demographic information, whether or not physical force was used, what happened as a result. But one of the areas that is most interesting is this question of what circumstances led to the stop. So an officer is only allowed to conduct a stop if they have reasonable suspicion that a person committed a crime. And the legal definition of reasonable suspicion needs to be what allows them to stop an individual without probable cause. It needs to uh, be something more than just a hunch that a person committed a crime, according to kind of the legal definitions here. But the form itself, historically, has included a bunch of things that don't necessarily meet that definition of, um, of reasonable suspicion. So this form is from like 2010, and it includes the checkbox for the movement. And when um, some throws one of the word in the word itself actually became a subject of a lot of political scrutiny. Where basically, uh, other sponsors were asked, okay, what is for it in this? Which, by the way, was spent 40% of the time up until that point as a reason for the stuff. And it has my it is not a main like a bird's activity, or somebody on the out of the building, or uh, somebody reached news to their pocket. All things that we do on the street every time. So as a result of this, one of the rulings that came out of the third court case was that the court itself had to change to reduce that checkbox. And so this is one of the ways that we can actually start to pay attention to the image charge with mail with the data collection, because the data is now going to look different after that change to the infrastructure than it had before that. And that really became as a result of a lot of advocacy and uh Legislation. Similarly, as the expansion of different ways of implementing the 311, like through the New York City, through kiosks, through the mobile app, through the website that's available, we see the number of people that are actually were so prior to these different charges. There was a lot of question about like, can people access 311 if it's only in the phone call, right? Do they always kind of ask this for that information? Um, the kind of evolution of the infrastructure itself reaches. Data. Um, but there's also issues when certain infrastructure is way down, here, like in the month following Hurricane City, it's very low. And you would ask yourself, why would that be the case? And the reason is that all the power lines are down, people can't have charged their phones, and no one is able to call for one in that case. Right? So we start to pay attention to those infrastructure because they play a role to do the data as well. What are the processes that went into the data collection? How are those processes standardized? What do data collectors do to ensure that things are comparable? And then what environmental forces start to work? So we can try our best to, you know, go on every day and collect the temperature and be at the exact same mood when we're collecting the temperature and collect it the exact way. But there's lots of environmental forces that are going to be encouraging us to enter different means now. So we start to pay attention to that. Uh, and then how did collectors navigate that? You can see that there are cases in 2018 when the DOT was closing tickets before they were actually open. And this is a result of some of the rituals that they have collected here, right? You have a fan rate 311 infrastructure where agencies are valid calls and they're responsible for keeping track of the data. And we might give them a protocol so that they need to follow. Um, but they each use the controls that we follow that are over a flow once it's no longer in the um, similarly, there are some similar stories around closing calls of students. We see these issues in some interest. This is the number of stops at the side of the Navy. There's just like some number that's supposed to indicate the values, how uh, I built that out, that was the amount that I would have been in. So that's my point for this. For me, I've looked at it in a thousand different ways, there's no logic to how these numbers are putting these questions up. And then the last piece that we'll talk about today is around advocacy. So what motivates the institution into great interest in this data and what did it have to the institution? So we can look at this John Madrid, the difference that will deliver these did incredible jobs to lead. So in 2002, following the 1999 order of Valley, um, the city council started requiring quarterly reporting of the John Madrid data. Um, and then in 2006, after another major shooting, the mayor said that the city council and they said, okay, where's the data? And the city council goes, oh, they saw it for 40 years ago. And so then it ensued that following this uh, legal now that spans two years, to actually get into this data to set up open it. 
And a lot of the kind of political lobbying happening at that time is the reason why the data set looks the way that it does today. So that they on how privacy was going to be removed, how the privacy concerns were going to be addressed, how the data, what kind of categories need to be So in some ways, like we think about all of these stories ultimately impact what ends up in our We're looking at the data. This is like an implosion of all the different cultural backstories that are happening. And in this case, where are the governments in the data that We might have a definition, but how that definition can be the way that it is, it's not necessarily included. So this ultimately impacts how we need to think about and communicate and prevent data. And it starts to pose the question of like, what is an ample data practice look like? So we're going to think about this in relation to some other New York City data sets. We didn't go on time. Um, so we have four data sets presented today. Um, we have park, the parks inspection. Uh, marking parks inspections. Yes. So basically, what we're going to do is we're going to move into four corners of the room. And we're going to, uh, each one of these groups is going to be engaging one of the different areas that we're going to be talking about to really grapple with what are the labor dimensions of this? What are the ritual dimensions of this? What are the discursive dimensions of this? So is anybody, is anybody here from parks or from housing or? Okay. That's all right. The students have developed awesome presentations to introduce you to these data sets. So you'll get to know the data sets a little bit and then we'll move through some activities to understand some of the other things that are happening within the workbook. Um, so we'll probably have park instructions go back here. Um, we'll have uh, tree census right here. We'll have the housing maintenance codes back there. And we'll have green thumbs over in this corner right there. Okay, so you all have a great conversation. I'm hoping to just quickly summarize, like, in very short amount of time with the kind of talk about. And then um, we'll wrap up so that we can get a clip. Um, so maybe if you want to get us started. Yeah, we talked about the slow parks inspection data set. Uh, we talked a lot about the definition of cleanliness and the definitions go into like how you inspect a park and like a lot of like how do you train someone to inspect a park? Do they have to walk the same route every time? Do they have to like look at the exact same things every time? And just the idea of the semiotics that go into the production of that data. So we talked about street trees. Um, we started with rituals, but then we turned all over and just talked through the data as well. It was wonderful. Um, but one of the parts that came up for at the end was how uncertainty is shown in the data set or not shown. So the transition in the census we used to be on a paper form where you would maybe write in the margin if you weren't sure about something. And now it's all recorded in the app. So like, is the data as certain as it looks? Or is there a level of uncertainty of, like, is this actually a red oak that we don't necessarily see interpreted as things into the database? Um, I was just going to add, going off, like, what Lawrence and what, like, is the obvious here in the data set. In 2015, the way that they were categorizing it was they were separating it to you. Volunteers are in a different, like, group than, like, people that are part of the parks department versus people that might get like, tree efficient or things like that. And so that was, I think that was the way that they, it wasn't like, oh, you're sure this is a red maple or whatever. I don't know. Right. <laughs> but um, the way that it wasn't just like that, like that was kind of And so we just thought that was very good. So my group worked with the housing code maintenance violations. And the two big things that really stood out in our group was we looked at through the framework infrastructures. So the first big one that was mentioned was this idea of how complicated it is to even report a violation, get follow through from a building inspector. And then having to take it to court, all of that be just such a mess. And all of these factors of if you work nine to five, like how is that going to happen? If you work multiple jobs, like how can you balance all of that and still have heat? And the second big one was this idea at a smaller scale of like how surveys are being conducted, who are the building inspectors, how are they taking surveys on sheets and reporting this information? If the tenants speak different languages, how are they communicating? What's their training? And there's a lot of uncertainties in that sense of like, how to even understand how information is being classified as being an emergency or not for this particular data set. Our group talks about Green Thumb, and that is a data set that deals with New York's community gardens. And we have the ad advocacy activity, so we talked a bit about the history, who had high stakes, low stakes, high influence, low influence. 
And just to sum up what we found that at the beginning, there's a very clear individual or group that has high stakes and also high influence. However, over time, it becomes less clear as, for example, governing bodies that can change rules and regulation of policing gardens aren't always very apparent and visible. So then that leads to like issues of like contracting and these gardens getting removed in huge groves because housing things and wanting property. And then as well, um, we have to think about like the maintenance of these gardens and how that's more than just, okay, you have to follow all these rules to get approval by Green Thumb. This is a green thumb garden. How do you like deal with water? How do you deal with the soil and all those kinds of things? So we just broke that down and thought about legal stuff and like actually running the gardens as well. No, I think I said I covered it all. Awesome. Okay, so wrap the first question. I'm just going to open it up for any last questions if anybody has any. All right. For which you can get to lunch. Um, this is my contact information. We've got a